Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds. So today we're doing something a, a little bit special right before Grand Rounds. Uh, we're inaugurating the um, Osher Integrative Medicine Clinical Map. So this is not a map just of the Osher Centers. The Osher Center is, is, is kind of in charge of sort of making this happen, but this is, this is a map about integrative medicine throughout Boston. And this is just, um, well, we started actually with, within Harvard Medical School, but we've also included other institutions, you know, around. And we're, we're hoping that this is going to extend out to a, a really comprehensive integrative medicine network in, in the Boston area. So we're very excited. This is just the very, very first little baby step. This map is not, uh, it's not live on our website yet, though it will be. But the reason we want to show it to you is because we would love to have your feedback on this map. So first, I'm going to show you how to how it works a little bit, just a few minutes, and then I want I'm at the end of the uh, presentation today, at the end of the grand rounds, we're going to give you a URL that you can uh, uh, take with you and then and then try it out. And this is a just a private site, just and and we'd love to have your feedback on it. So this map here um, has different components to it. It had, right now, we've identified all the sort of Harvard affiliated hospitals. So here's Children's, uh, Brigham, MGH, and then affiliated with these different uh, institutions and hospitals, we have a certain number of centers for integrated medicine. They're represented in the blue here. So for example, with MGH, you can see this is a bunch of one, two, three, four, five centers. And say, what are these centers? So. Uh, Catherine Gallagher Integrative Medicine Therapies Program, the Wellness Program, um, the Cardiac Rehab Program, and then somewhere it must be the Benson Henry Institute. There, it, there's the Benson Henry Institute, and you can see that at Benson Henry, there's a few, s several uh, people who work there, and you can look at all these different uh, people: Laura Malloy, Peg Bame, etc., and see what they do. And then you can also see the types of modality that well, you can actually pull it out if you want to see it a little bit clearer. You can see that um, at the Benson Henry Institute, there's Qigong, there's Tai Chi, there's uh, yoga, there's support groups, there's acupuncture, and you can see you can sort of navigate through all of these. Um, uh, all of these um, different centers and figure out what they do. And then you can also look by modality. For example, you can click on acupuncture here and you can see all the different centers that off offer acupuncture and who does it and, uh, um, I mean, and excuse me, and what, um, what uh, in affiliation they're associated with. Then we're gonna be having uh, each center, by clicking on the center, you'll be able to go to the website of that center and we don't have individual people's websites yet uh, identified, but we can at least uh, go to the center. And uh, if you unclick acupuncture, you can go back to the whole network. If you want to uh, look at, uh, you know, who, um, let's say for like individual people, again, you can you can find them. This person actually is no longer there. <laughs> we have to remove this person. There's uh, there's the Osher Center here. Um, so it, it's a really fun tool to play with. So what we would like, if you if you could uh, go uh, when you go home, is try it out. And uh, eventually, what we want to do is f try to find yourself if you think you should be on this network. If, if you're a practitioner of, of integrative medicine uh, and you, you and you're not and you don't find yourself on this network, please let us know. So you can right now email us at uh, at the um, it's hms right dot osher dot org. Or uh, eventually, I, would, I think in a couple of days, we're going to have a registration tool that's going to be directly linked to the map, so you'll be able to click on it and then register right there and give us your your what you where you work, your credentials, what you do, your expertise, and then we'll put you on the map if you qualify. <laughs> so in order to qualify, we, you know people need to be you know properly um, certified in their profession, and you know we're going to actually also ask. We'll, we'll we'll talk more about this about you know at future grand rounds. We're still in the process of, of figuring out how we're going to operationalize this in terms of uh, you know figuring out how 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 does somebody how do we decide if somebody belongs on this map or not right? So this is all and so um, so basically uh, this is it. So uh, and we we would absolutely welcome any if any and all feedback you know from 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 all of you on this so 
Um, we're going to now move to our presentation. And Dr. Darshan Mehta is going to lead the way. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really um, uh, a uh, uh, really a true pleasure being here and seeing again such a wonderful audience. I um, today's Grand Rounds is actually sort of um, is special on, on a couple of fronts. One is that uh, uh, our presenter is a is a fellow, and and which is really uh, in. Uh, in sort of the mission of the Osher Center of really pr promoting our learners uh, and trainees to really be at the forefront of integrative therapies and really think about these approaches critically. I wanted to just set the stage um, for the presentation um, and, and then um, and then we'll have uh, the presenters and then um, and, and then subsequently uh, uh, we'll uh, move into discussion and continue the discussion into our coffee hour. Uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping items. Um, our, our next uh, present uh, for the research, Integrated Medicine Research Seminar is this Thursday uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. and Dr. Uh, uh, Helen Langevin will be speaking on uh, stretching connective tissue fibrosis and cancer and that's going to be in the Shapiro, I mean I'm sorry, in the Zinner breakout room and, and so that's a slightly different location Oh, no, I'm sorry, same location, different name. Uh, uh, and then we have our next Grand Rounds on Tuesday, June 7th, uh, entitled Treating the Whole Patient, Nutritional Health Coaching in the Integrative Setting. Um, and our presenters are Caitlin Hosmer kirby Kathy McManus, and Don Levy from the Osher Center. And then finally, um, our next uh, research seminar after this, uh, the following uh, month on Thursday, June 9th from 4 to 5, and Laura Kubzanski, who is the co-director of the new Center for Health and Happiness at uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, um, is going to be talking about positive psychological functioning and enduring asset for healthy aging. So we got a wonderful set of upcoming talks. So with that, um, just sort of thinking about why, do we, uh, why are we doing this? Um, So integrative medicine, again, just why are we doing these grand rounds? And the idea is really to really ha have a critical uh, uh, and rational approach in thinking about integrative medicine. And I always like to show uh, these slides um, what, what, in terms of how we define uh, and think about integrative medicine. It's really combining, when patients approach this integrative therapies, they often are combining the best of what conventional and evidence-based camp therapies have to offer. It always is emphasizing patient participation, and so the self-care aspects, and we've talked tremendously about this in our, our, our series of grand rounds, uh, both on the clinical side and on the research side, uh, in thinking about exercise, diet, stress management, and maximizing health. It emphasized the primacy of the patient-provider relationship and the importance of shared decision-making, and you're going to, again, um, uh, hear a lot of that even in, as we even think about today's presentation as well. Uh, and it em emphasizes the contribution of the therapeutic encounter in itself. Much of what has really popularized integrative therapies, particularly in, um, uh, in, uh, in the patients we see, is, is really the relationship that they build with their provider. And, and that in itself, as research has pointed out, in itself has a very important therapeutic effect that we always want to keep in mind um, and, 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 and maximize on the clinical side. And finally, it seeks to optimize the in individual's innate healing capacity. So now when we approach something that is novel, that is new, you know, well, how do we want to think about it? And again, as a clinician, you know, I always, I, I use this sort of rubric, um, uh, uh, it was published some, um, over a decade ago now, to, you know, should something be to recommended, tolerated, avoided? And again, when we think about evidence of efficacy and safety, you know, obviously things that have high evidence of efficacy and safety we want to recommend and monitor. Uh, things that oftentimes uh, many of the integrative therapies fall into this category of inconclusive evidence of efficacy um, and we have some knowledge of safety and, and so we may accept it and monitor. Uh, we have sometimes uh, evidence of efficacy but don't have evidence of safety and so we, you know, the word tolerate and monitor and obviously things that have been disproven or have been shown to be unsafe we want to avoid and discourage. But the main word I want to uh, really encourage, and, and that is important in building the relationships with our patients, is around monitoring. We want to have constant dialogue with our patients whenever we're selecting something novel. And so this is, again, the, the, we balance quality, safety, and efficacy around patient preference. 
uh, especially in conditions for which there are limited treatment options. And, and I think that's something really to keep in mind, uh, and, and that's why having these dialogues with our patients is, is quite important. Obviously, if we mi misapply the model, when we focus on healing when cure is more appropriate, we're going to fail to cure the curable, uh, complicate the intervention, favors anecdotes over evidence, restricts access to care, and wastes our resources and, 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 and potentially lives. But again, when we focus on curing when healing is more important, the interactions and side effects, um, we, we, we don't think about the interaction and side effects. We depersonalize the uh, interaction. We favor science over values. Uh, we disenfranchise our patients. It separates prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation instead of having this continuity and encourages high cost. So rules that integrative medicine must follow really is really a care based on continuous healing relationships. We really want, we want customization based on patient needs and values. The patient is really at the source of control. There's shared knowledge and free flow of information. And this is really, you know, as evidence is accumulating, we're really using that evidence to guide our decision-making process. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ezra Cohen, who is a pediatric rheumatology fellow uh, here uh, at Boston Children's Hospital, uh, formerly he was a resident uh, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in pediatrics, and prior to that, uh, graduate of Harvard Medical School. So Ezra, please. Good morning. Um, I'm going to start by talking about a patient I took care of in clinic, and I'm hoping she's on the way. But we were hoping to involve her in today's discussion also. Um, so um, she's an 18-year-old girl who was referred to our clinic uh, initially for back pain, which began in, in eighth grade. And she describes the initial inciting event as happening during a soccer game when she turned abruptly and felt a tearing, a tearing pain in her lower back, mostly on the left side, but also on the right. Um, she describes a lot of features that are consistent with inflammatory arthritis that we recognize, pain with prolonged immobility, uh, pain in the morning, and also no nighttime awakening or other concerning features. She was initially evaluated by orthopedics and sports medicine. She had an MRI which showed mild uh, spondylolisthesis, which was uh, as well as pars articularis fractures, which were responsible for that. She had a mild central disc bulge, which was thought not to be responsible for her symptoms. And at that time, she didn't have her sacroiliac joints imaged. She was treated for spondylolisthesis, uh, rest uh, physical therapy, and also had a number of other treatments, some of which helped a little bit, such as the trigger point injections, but the other therapies did not really help her very much. Those included uh, bilateral SI joint injections with steroids. She, at that time, underwent a, a bone scan from the orthopedist and showed, uh, the bone scan showed some enhancement in her sacroiliac joints. As you know, the bone scan is a bit more sensitive for certain things than MRI. She, some other features of her history, which we pay attention to as rheumatologists, she had one episode of five days of fever with genital ulcers, which and subsequently has not had anything else like that, so that was thought to be a viral illness. Given the enhancement on her sacral iliac joints on the bone scan, she was referred to our clinic where we evaluated her. She had some other features on her family history, nothing very strong, but she had an aunt with psoriasis um, as well as a cousin with celiac disease. And on her exam, she had a positive figure four tests or Faber tests, which evaluate the sacral iliac joints as well as the hips. She had bilateral sacral iliac tenderness with palpation a little bit of pain with hip distraction, and no other findings of arthritis or signs of past arthritis on her exam. And she had a normal gait and, and normal function. Normal laboratory evaluation, including HLA B27, which turns out to be not that useful in pediatrics, but normal inflammatory markers. So based on the story, we thought that she might have had a combination of different, different things responsible for her pain. She clearly had history of multiple injuries, as evident on her MRI. It seemed like most of her pain was over the SI joints, and we had this bone scan showing enhancement. And the character of her, the, her report of pain is consistently stiffness with associated improvement over time, as well as worsening with immobility, which we find to be characteristic of inflammatory arthritis. So we kind of mulled over this and talked to, to radiologists, talked to her orthopedists, a number of other providers, and decided to trial her on medicines for sacroiliitis, so she was started on Enbrel. Initially, she had some improvement in her stiffness, but she didn't feel like her pain changed very much. 
and uh, at she, and at her um, last visit, she actually felt like the pain had some neuropathic features. She described radiation down her leg, and continued to describe these stiffness components. And overall, as if she, if she comes today, you'll be able to hear she didn't really feel like the Enbrel made a difference for her at all. We tried a number of other things while she was on Enbrel: amitriptyline, lidoderm, meloxicam, cyclobenzaprine. We did an MRI of her sacroiliac joints um, while she was on Enbrel, and that was completely normal, showing no enhancement at all. It was with contrast. And she's currently, uh, we decided to trial her off Enbrel to see if she had any change in her pain. And I referred her to the uh, Calmar Clinic, which will be discussed a little bit further down the line here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Calmare or scrambler therapy. The word Calmare is from the uh, Italian verb meaning to calm or to treat, to alleviate. It's a, a, a novel, non-invasive approach to pain management, which I initially heard about from a, a patient and then ended up doing research on. This is, the only, this is the first patient I've sent to this clinic. There are a number of clinics uh, over the country, but the closest one is actually in Warwick, Rhode Island. It's delivered through uh, a device, uh, electrocutaneous stimulation device. There are five pairs of electrodes that are placed around the painful area, and there are a number of parameters that are adjusted, including amplitude, frequency, placement of electrodes, uh, the shape of the packets, the electrical kind of signal that's being delivered. It does not uh, st directly stimulate the painful area, such as uh, similar devices like TENS are meant to do. It was developed by uh, Giuseppe Marineo about probably 10 or 15 years ago, and it was subsequently brought to the U.S. and um, marketed by the head of the current clinic in Warwick, Rhode Island. And it's also, as I said before, referred to as, as scrambler therapy. And the uh, proposed mechanism is that it replaces uh, painful sensations with non-painful neural signals. And it's been studied mainly in neuropathic pain, but more recently there have been some prospective studies, uh, not randomized trials, in, in generalized low back pain of, of any of any cause, but I'm going to discuss a little bit one particular trial. This is just a picture of the device showing what it looks like. Um, and this is uh, the, the article I'm going to discuss. So it's a randomized control trial conducted by the inventor. The sample size is 56, so on the smaller side. And um, they took patients with three different conditions, post-herpetic neuralgia, post-surgical pain, and spinal canal stenosis, and they took adults having a VAS or a visual analog scale intensity over greater than six, they had to have uh, failed t uh, having a TENS unit or having a response to traditional pharmacologic therapy. And they also uh, had to have features of uh, neuropathic pain, allodynia, hyperpathia, and pain last, that was present for six months and, and present for more than uh, four days out of the week, so having a chronic component and a persistent component. They, this trial excluded patients with serious psychiatric diseases, schizophrenia, major depressive disorder. Subsequent trials have not excluded patients with, with depression. And I should say this, this trial was focused on excluding patients primarily with major depression. Other uh, restrictions would be patients with seizures because of the theoretical risk of provoking a seizure with the electrical stimulation, metal devices, as well as any dermal, dermatologic conditions that would be exacerbated potentially by putting an electrode on over an open area or broken skin. And the therapy was performed by research assistants, but it was under the direction of someone who was trained in the therapy and had experience uh, administering it. And as I'll discuss a little bit later, it can be quite operator dependent and takes some amount of time to uh, become comfortable with. And then th these patients with these, the patients with these three different conditions underwent stratified randomization. So there was an equal distribution of patients from each d disease category or condition in each, uh, in the treatment and the usual care group. So the usual care group basically took patients uh, on whatever medicine they were on and switched the medicine according to the most up-to-date guidelines at the time of the European Federation of Neuro uh, Neurologists' recommendations for treating neuropathic or chronic pain. And this is a quote from the, from the paper, but the most common baseline therapy would be amitriptyline, gabapentin, or tramadol, and that was often switched to one that was potentially more effective either switch from ones in the uh, same class or different class. Many patients were started on opioids, according to these guidelines, in the usual care group. And in the scrambler group, they received, which is what is now the conventional course of treatment, which is about 
45 minutes or an hour a day, five days a week, repeated uh, the next, the following week. And the idea is basically to build up a persistence of response that lasts beyond the treatment session. And that's the goal of the therapy. The pr principal investigator who was trained in this chose the areas uh, each, at each treatment center that were uh, optimized for that patient, really based on their response, how they described their pain, the goal is to put the electrodes on, to adjust the parameters so that they don't feel any pain at all. That, that's, the, that, that's the goal of, of the therapy, and then the hope is that that persists uh, increasingly with each treatment. And there were uh, no change of drug therapy in the scrambler group at all. This is um, just a, a flow chart showing the, the breakdown and the, sort of the important point here, I think, is that there was no dropout. It was a small trial, but there was no unequal dropout or other uh, causes for bias due to, due to dropout. And the primary endpoint was uh, change in the pain VAS score at one, two, at, uh, and three months. This is just a brief description of the, st the stats analysis, which basically just used a time by treatment interaction and ANOVA to analyze the change, longitudinal change. And uh, the secondary endpoints were allodynia, change in medication use things. I'm not going to discuss quite as much. And this is the, the primary outcome, basically. Rather, this is the, the distribution of groups showing that there were equal numbers of patients in each group. And this is, again, due to stratified randomization, which was deliberate from the beginning. This is the uh, primary outcome showing that both, uh, both groups started a similar VAS score prior to the study, uh, around eight. After one month, the scrambler group, or the, the usual care group went down to about 5.84, and the scrambler group went to 0.78 in terms of the, VA, the average VAS in the last week. At three months, the scrambler group, you can see, got a little bit worse, whereas the usual care group stayed about the same. That's somewhat consistent with the known effects. To the, the effects of this are thought to wane over time. And the, the end result was, was significant with a p-value less than 0 0.001 for the global F statistic. Other features which were mentioned in the article, allodynia was reduced at one and three, uh, three months. Opioids were eliminated in 11 out of 17 cases. They were halved in one case, unchanged in one. There was, uh, opioid reduction wasn't reported because it wasn't uh, comparable to con compare across groups because the other, many patients in the other group were actually started on opioids as a part of the guidelines, the European guidelines. And immediately after treatment in 21 out of 26 patients, the pain was relieved entirely. At one month, the percentage reduction, which I showed you before, was about 91% in the scrambler group and 28% in the usual care control group. And at three months, 75% reduction, again, compared to a similar reduction of 20, 28%. So I'm just going to discuss some of the, the limitations. So often studies are criticized for a small sample size. So in this respect, the, there was a significant effect size, so the small study doesn't contribute to it being underpowered at all, but it does contribute to the generalizability because you're only dealing with a small population of people, so potentially less generalizable. Um, not all with, would agree with the drug regimens using the control arm, but it was a consensus based on European neurologists. There's quite a, a large group of people. There was not a control, the control group was not a sham scrambler therapy group. However, there are actually studies being done in that with those thoughts in mind, uh, but those are also quite small. The publisher of the article is the inventor, and there's potential for bias on that basis alone, and the fact that he probably is very uh, well trained in this, and so he may have results that would outstrip others uh, with, with training that isn't quite as significant. I mentioned the operator dependence before also, the uh, placement of electrodes, all sorts of other features have a significant impact on whether you're able to bring the pain down to zero. And unclear whether uh, patients who don't have such clear features of uh, neuropathic pain would benefit quite as much. They excluded patients who didn't have allodynia and other cutaneous symptoms. In terms of strengths, the effect size was large. The arms were well balanced without, uh, without unequal dropout. And uh, they analyzed multiple subtypes of pain. You could, you could, I think, conceive of this either as a weakness or a strength. The, the groups are so small, you 
couldn't compare them directly. You're talking about groups of like 14 or eight or four, but uh, potentially it's going to be something that's use could be something that's useful for multiple different types of pain, of neuropathic pain. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Maljavin to talk about mechanism of action. Yeah. Oh, I can discuss. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're hoping. Um, let's see if she. She may be still in traffic. So she, I sent her to this clinic, and I also went separately from her, and, and it was an interesting experience. But her experience was that she went to the clinic and um, had her, the initial visit. Oh, the other thing I should say is that because in some of the studies, there were, uh, it was shown that being on a central acting pain medicine predicted less of a response, maybe with the thought that it interfered with some of the the neural reprogramming or the replacement of non-pain information. And for that reason, many patients either have to go off or wean down to some extent on, on those medicines to hope for a better effect. She went to the clinic and found that when she was on the machine, she actually had no pain. And that was the first time she, she had zero pain for months or, or, or years. And the pain, uh, unfortunately, came back immediately after treatment. and. Did not, she didn't have any persistence of, of being pain-free. And I think that was, it sounds like it was an unusual situation based on Dr. D'Amato's experience, but he often sees that in conditions where there's something else primarily driving her pain. In this case, we thought perhaps arthritis, perhaps not. And she was on Enbrel at the time, so there wasn't at least an inflammatory explanation for why she would have had persistent pain, but she had pain, uh, no pain on the machine and then she had no lasting relief, which was, which was too bad. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, this is an interesting case, I think, generally, because I think this is, an, this is a, uh, a nice opportunity for us to discuss what, what, how do we deal with things like, for example, a device or a treatment that is out of the ordinary, that either we've never heard of, patient comes in, I, oh, this, is, this thing I've heard sounds fantastic, my uncle or somebody else did it and it got a lot better. And so how do we have this, this conversation with our patients? Then the other component of this, which, which is an interesting thing, is that what if you have some, a device like this that makes claims, like physiological claims? And as, as academic you know, uh, health providers, we are, it behooves us, I think, to not simply say, oh, well, you know, this is just some, a device that, well, it, it doesn't matter. It's an impressive device. The patient believes it's going to help, so probably, you know, if, if it helps, that's fine. It'll, you know, lead to a nice placebo effect, and it doesn't really matter if it's all kind of just, you know, um, in, in fabricated, uh, you know, claims that that this device actually does in terms of physiological effects. But I think we have to go a little bit deeper than that. We have to wonder to ourselves, you know, do we, do, do we believe that these claims make sense? And I think that uh, for, for something like this, I mean, it, it, I personally got a little bit interested in this device because I was wondering, you know, what, what is it exactly that it could plausibly do? So there's two claims. If you read the literature on this device and you look on their website, and it's not difficult to find. I actually dug a little bit deeper, actually went and read some of the patent applications because I got really interested in it. Um, but there are two things that are claimed. The first is that this device specifically stimulates C fibers. And that is, they, they kind of position themselves on, a, on the market, essentially, as being different from plain old transcutaneous nerve stimulation, which you know, the, 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 the traditional theory underlying transcutaneous nerve stimulation is it acts via the, the gate control and that it, uh, of, of pain, where it stimulates the large afferent fibers that then block the pain signal at the level of the spinal cord. And they say, no, 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 this is not what our device does. Our device specifically stimulates pain fibers. But then there's something else that it does. So what, okay, so if it stimulates pain fibers, then why doesn't it just cause pain, right? If you stimulate a pain fiber, it says no. What it does is it actually provides information through these pain fibers, which is non-pain. 
So it stimulates the five fav fibers in a different way somehow, and it, it uses fancy algorithms to vary the, the shape of the waveform, and somehow, and they, they provide these information packets, and they scramble the information so that the pain fiber now believes that it's getting something other than a pain signal. Wow, I mean, that sounds kind of cool, but is it plausible? You know, could that possibly work? So when you look into it a little bit, so the three questions, right, that are pertinent to here. Can an electrical stimulation device preferentially stimulate C-fibers? Is that even possible? Number two, are the concepts of an, what they call artificial neuron or non-pain information, is that possible? And number three, is this device really different from, from something like transcutaneous nerve stimulation or is it just a more expensive and fancy version? So if you look at, at this um, what, what essentially happens during any of these stimulators, they, they, they send a little sort of pulse of current that is repeated at various different intervals and the, 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 the width of the pulse varies. So just to give you an example, here is transcutaneous nerve stimulation and you can see that it cr creates a very, very short sort of pulse. This is a unipolar and this is bipolar, but you can see here that the duration of the pulse here is uh, 0.03 milliseconds, and here it's 0.1 milliseconds, so very, very, very short, and that's repeated at frequent intervals, so that the typical sort of frequency of transcutaneous nerve sim stimulation is between 50 and 100 hertz. So 100 hertz is 100 pulses per second, but the pulses themselves are so small, they're like a thousandth of a second, or less, actually, one ten thousandth of a second for 0.1 uh, milliseconds. So it's, it's, it's a very, very short, short, short amount of, and we know that the effect of TENS, you can block it, um, uh, excuse me, you, you do not, it is not blocked by application of capsaicin. Capsaicin is a cream that you can apply, to, like in hot chili peppers, and it blocks C fibers. So if you, if, if TENS worked via C fibers, capsaicin would block it, in its case it doesn't. So we know that TENS at this frequency is, is uh, acts through other fibers other than C fibers. The A delta fibers are kind of in between, but typically they, some of them are more in the C fiber category. But right now we're just going to talk about the large and the, and the small, just to sort of simplify things a little bit. So what about something like electroacupuncture? That's a little bit different because typically electroacupuncture, you can, the, the, the frequency of the, of the stimulation is a little bit lower quite a lot lower actually, two to 10 hertz is typically how people uh, do it. And, and the duration of the electrical stimulus is longer. You can see here, this particular instance, it's 0.4 milliseconds, so 400, 400 of a second, but it can actually even be longer, up to one or several of, and s milliseconds, so that the pulses are, sh are further apart, but the duration of each pulse is longer. And you, we know that at that frequency, you can block the effect of electroacupuncture with capsaicin. So what that means is that it, it's acting via a different mechanism, and we know that this type of, of stimulus stimulates the small afferents, including the C fibers and also the A deltas, and it acts upon using a different mechanism that involves a sort of ascending and then descending impulses through the brainstem and down, and these are, these are opiodergic, uh, uh, pathways that come back to the spinal cord and then reduce the pain. So it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism called diffuse noxious inhibitory controls. You may have heard of this, DNIC. It's a well-described mechanism that involves uh, sort of a, a little bit slightly more involved pathway, uh, but, it's, it, but it also requires a stimulus that's quite strong, and that's what's called diffuse noxious. These stimuli have to be, have to have enough of a, of a quality that the patient, it's almost painful. The more, the higher you turn up the current, the better this works. And that's because they need, it needs, and of course you don't want to tolerate it, turn it up such that the patient is experiencing pain. But you want to get that fine line that it's stimulating those C fibers and those A delta fibers in order to stimulate the, the, the opiodergic system, but not so, so high that you're exacerbating the pain. So what about Calmari? If you look at here, the duration of the stimulus is very, very long, 10 milliseconds, very long. And so they really feel that that's, that's part of, I, I think that's one of the reasons why 
I think they are probably correct in saying that it does stimulate C-fibers because it's compatible with what we know about C-fibers. Okay, what about the other claim? That these packets information vary over time and that somehow they scramble the information and they provide you know, non-pain information. They also say that the individual waveform produced by the Calmari device are similar to those of action potentials of nerves. And by varying the waveform, they can somehow vary the, the, what happens to the nerve. Now, that seems a little weird. The reason why that's weird is because if you look, I mean, this is the well-known sort of shape of an action potential, right, where you have depolarization and repolarization. And if you look at this as the Calmari waveform, yeah, well, okay, you could say, yeah, it kind of looks like an action potential a little bit. But these, what drives these two waveforms is completely different. What drives the action potential is a very complex sort of opening and closing of ion channels, and, and that's what causes the depolarization and the repolarization. With here, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this electrical device, all you're doing really is you're switching the polarity between the anode and the cathode such that the electrons are moving back and forth. The only reason you switch the polarity is so that you don't have accumulation of ions through electrolysis at the electrode itself, because otherwise what that would do is that would just eventually cancel the current, because the current wouldn't flow anymore if you had sort of the, these ions moving. So it m makes no physiological sense that the fact that this current is bipolar simply means that the electrons are moving back and forth. It has nothing to do with the inward and outward movement of ions in and out of the nerve. Now the next thing that they, the Calmari sort of literature tells us is that by varying this waveform, you see this is the Kalmeyer waveform. wave form, you see all those different waves form that I sort of copied here because I thought it was fascinating. So, so you see that they're all different. Some of them have a bigger latency, some of them have a bigger pulse, some of them, and so yeah, so of course you're, 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 you're providing all this sort of complex information to the nervous system. Does that matter? Well, no, because the nerve doesn't know. All the nerve is going to do is going to create action potentials whenever it's got, whenever the amount of electrons that reaches it reaches a certain level, and then it's going to fire. And all that's going to matter, it, what it's going to do is that the fire, the neuron may fire either more frequently, more bursts, and the, 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 um, the, the intensity of the burst or the duration of the burst may change. But it's not going to change anything about how the action, uh, the neuron behaves. So really, you know, the conclusion, I think, that after looking through this quite, quite extensively, is uh, my own conclusion is that it is indeed plausible that this device will stimulate small afferents at A, a delta or C fibers, but it's very unlikely that this, this kind of, it would produce anything other than either a pain signal if it's turned up high enough, which apparently, you know, it probably isn't uh, if, if, the, if the, the person is, is doing their, their job properly and not exposing the patients to pain, but it could certainly activate the DN DNIC uh, system. That's very plausible. And then the other thing is that I think the analgesic effects of this uh, may be similar to uh, electroacupuncture if you think about it physiologically, and, 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 and then it's very plausible that the two could share. So, okay, so does it matter if the mechanism of Calmari therapy are not as claimed as long as it helps patients, right? Well, Calmari, first of all, is more expensive than conventional TENS. Um, it owns only performed in specialized centers. Uh, it's not portable, so therefore patients cannot bring it home like TENS units do. On the other hand, the long stimulus duration and the activation of the DNIC may be helpful. And this is maybe why, in this particular clinical trial that uh, Dr. Cohen presented, the effect was quite uh, impressive in terms of clinical size. So it may be a helpful thing. And it may achieve effects similar to electroacupuncture, but without needles. So there's, it's not like really, um, it's, it's not like it's, uh, uh, um, we're not concluding that this device is, is useless, on the contrary. However, it's important that un, un, um, unlikely or un, unplausible physiological claims, we shouldn't just simply take those and, and sort of spit them back to our patients because that's not doing them a service. It's not doing us a service either. Um, and I think it's, it's important that we kind of, um, are a little bit skeptical and critical uh, in when those types of claims are made. So uh, I'm going to uh, pass over the microphone to Dr. Lee, who's going to tell us about management of pain in children. Great. So I want to first start off with that um, I am a 
adult rheumatologist, but um, we do use some of these same um, treatments in pa- in pediatrics. And so basically, I think the most common thing that you see um, that's similar to this would be TENS, as Dr. Langevin mentioned. And so what is the evidence actually for TENS um, in children? And so when I did the literature search on this, I found that there was actually not a huge amount of literature. A lot of it was dating back to the uh, 1990s, 1980s. One of the best studies was this first one here, which looked at procedural pain. Um, this study was 514 kids um, blocked into six two-year groups of age groups between five and 17 years, and then randomized to TENS, sham TENS, and then control. And what they found was that pain intensity and affect were lowest for the TENS group and highest for the control group. And that, pen, that sorry, pain was greater for the lower age groups and then higher, or less for the higher age groups. So it seemed to work better for the higher age groups. And so that was the biggest, largest study, but it was on pr- procedural pain, not, say, chronic pain from an illness. And so the next study that I'm going to talk about is this one that was done on sickle cell pain. And so this was a randomized, double-blind crossover study of TENS versus sham TENS. And they found they used 60 children in um, four different crisis severity categories of sickle cell. And they found that the overall treatment efficacy was higher in the TENS group, there was, but there was also a significant placebo effect in the sham um, group. And they also found that there was no significant difference in actual pain ratings or analgesic requirements. So this was kind of a positive in some ways that some of the other secondary outcomes were not positive. Oh, doing the wrong computer. So um, these are some of the more negative studies. These do tend to be smaller than the bigger positive studies, so possibly there was an issue of sample size in some of these studies. Um, and so this, the first one was post-operative pain. 45 children, ages 11 to 21, randomized to t- TENS, sham TENS, and control. T- TENS group used less total milligrams of analgesics, but required actually more frequency of dosing. So overall, it wasn't certain what was the right outcome there. And then neither outcome was statistically significant. And then the next study was dental pain, with 30 children randomized to TENS, sham TENS, or anesthesia by local injection. And so they found no statistical difference by self-report, pain by facial signs, or the number of additional oral injections required to complete treatment. And TENS was no less effective than anesthesia was the conclusion. But since TENS was no more effective than sham TENS, the thought was that this was probably working through more of a distraction um, um, mechanism than anything else. And so what about other perhaps more conservative treatments, more conventional treatments? What about those for low back pain in kids and adolescents? And so there were a couple of recent um, systemic review, systematic reviews about this. This one uh, found in the end only two RCTs with a total N of 125 um, that they were able to meta-analyze. And this was looking at a supervised exercise program versus no treatment. And they found that there was a pooled mean benefit of 2.9 points on a 0 to 10 scale for pain. And then they also mentioned a few other studies um, that they were single studies, they didn't meta-analyze, that they were, saw no difference between supervised and supervised programs and home exercise programs, and they saw small improvement in pain among those using a seat wedge versus those who did not. So not a huge amount of data here. And then this study was a systematic review looking at physical therapy. And what they found was that for all outcome measures, the average effect size of the treatment groups was statistically and clinically significant, whereas the control groups had effect sizes that were not statistically significant. So they didn't actually directly compare, but they were looking at the physical treatment group by itself and then the control groups by themselves. They didn't directly compare the two. And then they also tried to look at different types of physical therapy treatments to see if there was a specific type of treatment that was more effective than the others. And this was hard to say, but they thought maybe manual therapy was more helpful than the others. 
And I guess, so what, where does this leave us? What do we normally do for um, low back pain in children and adolescents? I think this is one good example of a general therapy prescription for chronic pain um, with kids. And that is um, at least 60 minutes of developmentally appropriate uh, varied aerobic activity daily, and then assessment of biomechanics and functional studies that produce pain, and then really slowly, gradually progressing kids and adolescents back to sports-specific functional activities, such as drills and things like that. And then there is a role for a limited use of heat, ice, TENS, or manual therapy to facilitate this participation in functional exercises. And then there's been more recently looking at technology and what you can do with technology like smartphone apps and things like that to help with this. And so using diaries, pedometers, fitness trackers, maybe as linked to a device um, for kids. And then education on consistent activity level and really pacing, not to just go out there and do everything all at once and then pay for it later, but to really pace over time. And so that's all I have. And so now I think we're moving into discussion. Great. Oh, before we do um, the discussion, I want to leave you with, uh, just so that you have a chance to write it down, that's the URL for the map if you want to. Great, okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, we'll have her. So, again, uh, thank you. Um, uh, so Ezra Cohen, Yvonne Lee, who, as she mentioned, is a, is a department clinician researcher here in the Department of Rheumatology, uh, and Dr. Langen. Um, so we wanted to uh, open up for questions. So again, this has been a really uh, stimulating discussion. This has been awesome to just see how we think about a novel therapeutic approach, uh, both from uh, research uh, perspectives as a, as a clinical application and how we begin to evaluate, make recommendations, um, and, and also think about what might be next steps as well. So with that, um, yeah, Gary. Interesting, um, perplexing. Um, I'd like to speak to the mechanism as an electrophysiologist and someone who studies pain. Um, the, the way that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, neurons respond to extracellular stimuli has little to do with the intrinsic properties during an impulse. So that when we put current in from a surface electrode, um, there are inductive properties and capacitive properties of the tissue itself, which will shape the response. So to equate the stimulus properties, the stimulus shape, with the uh, properties of an action potential um, would be a mistaken approach. Um, I wonder, and uh, one other thing is that there are different types of C fibers, and they're not all nociceptors. Um, and nociceptors themselves respond differently there are subliminal frequencies that will activate nociceptors, but not lead to the perception of pain, which might be a useful therapy. So that's an aside. Caution against making C fibers homogeneous in, uh, in terms of modality, and also in terms of their electrophysiology. Um, we do know that the skin, um, the keratinocytes in the epidermis are full of opiates, however, um, and that they're, they're linked um, in broad syncytia, so there are patches of electrically coupled. And I wonder whether stimulating with these electrodes might release opioids that would then act in the, in the systemic circulation to produce some analgesia. The fact that Ezra, your patient, experienced immediate relief um, is curious, since apparently others have not. Um, it's weird. <laughs> Other, um, other questions? Yeah, Don. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm Neil Schechter from the, I run the chronic pain program at Children's. Yeah. Hi, Ezra. Uh, uh, so I have a question about the initial study that you suggested. With five days a week times two weeks, uh, there's a lot of potential in therapeutic encounter there, given what you talked about just earlier. And I wonder, what was the, the control group or whatever, what was their level of interaction? And is it the encounter and the relationship itself yeah. that has more value than Calmarie's? 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point. I, I think the interaction was definitely less. They didn't, um, I, I know they had fewer visits for sure. They had their visits were definitely more intermittent, so that could be a large component of, of what's going on for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Don. I guess I'm talking as um, <coughs> the director of the OSHA clinic where we deal with a lot of chronic pain, and this was a little odd to me because if someone had come in our door, a teenager with back pain, it would have been a totally different start, at least, uh, being a, a, a clinic devoted to integrative medicine. For example, we would have recognized immediately we probably need a multidisciplinary team. We probably need to address their suffering as well as their pain because the meaning of this pain is very important to this young lady. And then I just wrote down on the back of the envelope about 12 things we might have considered before this, what I call the latest gimmick. So I'm a little skeptical because I spend a lot of time looking at these uh, things and they generally provide short-term relief, um, especially in, um, they work a little less if there's not a gimmick in the control group, some kind of electrical anything. Um, but I just wrote down, God, we would have tried acupuncture with electrical stim, chiropractic, any form of advanced tissue massage, myofascial release, we would have tried craniosacral therapy. We wanted to try these all, we would have considered them and see if they were relevant some kind of yoga-based movement therapy, definitely engage mind-body, biofeedback, uh, counseling about pain, being less catastrophic, et cetera. Um, we would have thought of anti-inflammatory supplements like alpha-lipoic acid, acetyl-L-carnitine, turmeric, fish oils in high doses, gamma-linolenic acid. Probably we would have even gone to a topical compounded preparation that can be very effective for a kid, especially. So it's an odd, um, thing to me that those weren't considered, and I, or maybe they were considered, and we missed that. So I guess that's my question. I didn't go into all the details. She did have acupuncture, massage, multiple rounds of PT. She's being going to be seen at the pain clinic upcoming, so that was an appointment we had arranged. We did, we tried topical capsaicin, uh, rather topical lidoderm. We didn't do capsaicin. The reason I didn't originally set her up, uh, I mean, as you know, the 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 clinic at Children's is every patient seen by psychologist, PT, and by um, a pain physician. She is, not that this necessarily means that psychological components aren't at play in her, in her condition, but she's very functional from my interactions with her, healthy, though it takes an emotional toll on her. She mostly copes with it very well, I would say. It's not to say that everything you said isn't true, that helping get you know, CBT for catastrophizing and all those things wouldn't be very helpful, but that was the reason I didn't initially refer her to counseling as, as an example. But she had already had five years of treatments with chiropractic and, and most of the things you mentioned, um, with a few exceptions, yeah. Hey, can, uh, Ezra, can, can you point out, give a sense of, um, when we think of, how much, does, how much does 10 sessions, how much does it cost in current, uh, as it's currently being prescribed? Which initially threw, threw us off the scent is that uh, I, I think we were con uh, we had some we had significant confidence in the fact that she had an inflammatory component to her pain too, so we were really focusing on that initially, and then I think it became clear that it wasn't she wasn't getting any benefit from the from the, the TNF inhibitor, so the cost of the so the cost of the machine is somewhere between 100 and, and 150 thousand, and the cost of the treatments most of which this particular doctor is getting retroactive reinsur uh, insurance reimbursement for, but not for everyone, is about 250 sessions, so it's $2,500 for two weeks, about. Um, so it's, it's very expensive. Uh, and I think in a lot of situations, he's able to get the retroactive reimbursement, but it's not. Initially, you have to pay initially, so. Um, are there other questions? Yeah. This isn't so much a question as a uh, sort of an, an observation, although was there, an, I think you said in the beginning there was an initial event that triggered the pain. What was the initial event? She, think, she thinks she sort of, she thinks she turned funny in soccer and had uh, pulled something and then uh -huh. from that point on uh -huh. had... Um, so, you know, speaking again and just going on what Don said about the suffering as, a, as an alternative holistic and an energy therapist, I would certainly see the meaning of this to her, uh, the, her beliefs around what happened to her as incredibly significant to be dealt with. 
And the interesting thing is she's been able to continue with soccer and lacrosse unimpeded, this, which is why I said that she's, been a very, she's really been very functional. And, Other, other questions or comments? I'm curious to if there's input from some of the other integrative medicine providers in the room in terms of how you think of, um, uh, how you might think of a treatment uh, approach. If there, I know we have some experts here in the room, so anyone want to, yeah, yeah. Would there be anything different in terms of frequency or intensity? Yeah. So I'm not a pain specialist. I'm a naturopathic doctor, so we have some electrical therapy training as part of our, um, you know, schooling. Um, and I don't use it here. We're not licensed to. Uh, but just in terms of sort of how we construct use of electric therapies around pain, in general, we're thinking of it more for specific tissue repair. So I'm actually not. I mean, I think it um, different frequencies for different pain receptors. I wonder if you had tried. Did you try tens first? She had tens, yeah. And it hadn't been effective. I just, the only piece that we haven't said out loud is that in general, when we're thinking about electrical therapies, we're thinking about sort of changing some of the factors that are in the skin in the area around the pain. So we're thinking about sort of like, you know, bringing nutrients in and out and sort of pulsing it in a way that's going to encourage tissue repair and regeneration. So if the inflammation was at a point where it didn't need to be physically addressed, it's something that wouldn't necessarily have been the first go-to. But I get, I get really into the electrical stuff. So I think it's exciting to sort of consider, but then it I can comment on that. I, I became fascinated with this just as I was I brought into this discussion kind of by accident. <laughs> but I, I felt that it was very interesting at first my first reaction to this was a little bit what Dr. Levy was saying, well this is just another fancy gimmick. There are so many devices like this that are that are on the market that that people use and that are very, you know, impressive to patients. And then my, one of my favorite studies, a very, very old studies from the, from the 1970s, I think, where they had a, a TENS unit and they varied the number of little lights and switch and things that beeped and blinked and stuff. And the more lights you had, the stronger the effect, you know, the more impressive. And we know this. I mean, expectation, you know, is such a huge component of treatment. So. When you have something that has a high expectation, the patient's traveling all the way to Rhode Island for this, putting in a lot of effort, putting in a lot of her own sort of hopes. And so the chances that perhaps if you compared the placebo effect resulting from a treatment like that with the placebo effect of a little sort of box that some tens box that somebody's going to throw at you and say, oh, try this, it might help. You know, it depends. You know, there's not a lot of, you can't compare the two. There's, there's such a big difference. So that was my first kind of reaction, <laughs> sort of looking at this thing. Um, and then reading the kind of absurd sounding sort of physiological explanation for what this device was supposed to do reinforced my prejudice that really there's nothing there. Uh, and this is just kind of a, you know, a gimmick. But then when I started looking into it, then, well, perhaps in, in a, you know, this device stumbled upon a mode of electrical stimulation, which may actually be physiologically, um, you know, beneficial in patients with pain. And Dr. Strucharts was pointing out even a couple of mechanisms that I hadn't thought about. Um, but, you know, these things need to be researched. I mean, there's only one way to answer a question like that is to look into it. And so I think that the first thing is the critical reading of the literature is the first step. Uh, balancing what we read about a device like this relative to what we know about just general knowledge and then if we don't know enough general knowledge to actually ask uh, you know somebody who who, who knows and um, more about the physiology but I think and then of course in time if enough clinical trials support the use of this then somebody needs to go in there and figure out what the real physiology of this thing is so okay. oh, Linda yeah Okay. Uh, I mean, I really enjoy it. I don't know anything about uh, this uh, 
the lectures, but as quenu psychotherapy is the work, work at the Osher Center, if this type of patient come, uh, we usually see, you know, the pain are different, but the quenu psychotherapy, we do have like a whole, uh, like a whole body adjustment. My question is, does it hit her pain even in the back? Does it have only link? Just talk about the fascia system. Maybe have some area uh, related. We see like a primary cause. Maybe it's in the back. Maybe it's not. That's a, a clinical approach. Would be, you know, would be our with the other options. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's one uh, issue that we uh, we tend to do as as uh, physicians. We tend to compartmentalize a problem and look at the back or the sacroiliac joint when in fact there's a lot more to the patient and not just their emotions but also the rest of their body um, their neck their shoulders everything else the way they are their fascia their you know so yeah i mean and this is what a lot of integrative medicine approaches are are good at is really looking at the whole person I guess my comment would riff off of G. Um, my name is Linda Danzig. I'm an acupuncturist and massage therapist. And so with this case, um, it seems like, so we were presented with a possible causative factor that she sustained an injury during a soccer match. But then it triggered this extensive um, injury. So I'm just wondering, about her constitutional type prior to this and, and why she's not healing if this triggered a, an autoimmune response or something in the like. And in any case, um, so her, her prior history and her constitutional tendency would be um, my investigative um, inquiry. Um, her response to the injury, what was happening at this game, was it a, you know, a deal breaker for a scholarship or, you know, how important was this to her? Um, and then in terms of treatment, um, I think a daily approach, and I, I would be wondering about even herbal medicine, um, moving blood, um, supporting the sinews, the deep tendons around this particular area. Um, was it raining out that day? Was there a... Um, what we would refer to as a dampness that somehow was pervasive if it was treated with cold. Cold can be pervasive to an injury site and then you have to treat it with heat therapy um, and herbs and external applications like moxibustion and, and heat could potentially be very helpful for that. Um, hey, Yvonne, can you just comment um, uh, just sort of how often do you see a um, like a sports injury sort of unmasking an underlying rheumatologic um, condition versus it actually tr you know there's sort of this interesting thing of unmasking versus triggering and and do you see or is it hard to sort of dis uh, differentiate between them? Yeah, no, I think it's very hard to differentiate. It was interesting kind of hearing all this discussion here about and the focus on this injury um, because I think as a rheumatologist and having been trained to think about autoimmune diseases and all that like the instant. I heard this was like, hmm, did the injury actually have anything to do with it at all? Um, like, was it just because since she had back pain later, then, you know, you attribute things to certain things that happened in the past. And I think that's very hard to tell. And I think the tendency of rheumatologists is to do that, but maybe we shouldn't, but like how to figure out the difference. So I don't think in this case, my, my thought is that probably the injury didn't trigger an autoimmune disease. I guess my question to Ezra is like, how convinced you are that she has uh, uh, an inflammatory autoimmune process going on or not? Because it sounded like you were pretty convinced in the beginning because you gave her Enbrel and all that. And I guess if that was the case, like what were the thought processes about trying a different um, medication in that line while doing these other things? Because um, it seemed like Enbrel is the only thing that was done. She, um I think that it's not that you know, the features of, of stiffness are thought to be maybe the most reliable or can be very helpful for rheumatologists to try to figure out whether it's inflammatory cause of pain. Unfortunately, sacroiliitis is an area that can be very tricky to diagnose in part because it generally shows no signs of systemic inflammation on blood tests. Imaging studies can even be negative, although most of the time those are helpful too. 
and we never had an initial MRI of that area before treatment. So in, in, initially, we thought it was possible that this was something that was missed and was responsible for her, her pain. I would say now I'm uh, not at all convinced that she has. I think it's not likely that she has an inflammatory cause. We did try other medicines. We didn't try steroids. Um, we, that's something that I am sometimes a little bit reluctant to try because people have a really significant placebo benefit, and then you don't really know what to do because you don't have anything really easy to transition them to. But she was on meloxicam, which is a strong NSAID, and she didn't have any benefit uh, from that. Okay. I'm just uh, mindful of our time. The, the features of, of stiffness are thought to be maybe the most reliable or very, can be very helpful for rheumatologists to try to figure out whether it's inflammatory cause of pain. Unfortunately, sacroiliitis is an area that can be very tricky to diagnose, in part because it generally shows no signs of systemic inflammation on blood tests. Imaging studies can even be negative, although most of the time those are helpful too. And we had that area before treatment. So in, in, initially, we thought it was possible that this was something that was missed and was responsible for her, her pain. I would say now I'm uh, not, I think it's not likely that she has an inflammatory cause. We did try other medicines. We didn't try steroids. Um, 